Chapter 18 of Gossip in a Library. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eugene Smith. Gossip in a Library by Edmund Goss. Chapter 18. Bo Nash. The Life of Richard Nash, Esquire, Late Master of the Ceremonies at Bath. Extracted principally from his original papers. The Second Edition. London, J. Newberry, 1762. There are cases, not known to every collector of books, where it is not the first, which is the really desirable edition of a work, but the second. One of these rare examples of the exception which proves the rule is the second edition of Goldsmith's Life of Bow Nash. Disappointment awaits him who possesses only the first. It is in the second, that the best things originally appeared. The story is rather to be divined than told as history, but we can see pretty plainly how the lines of it must have run. In the early part of 1762, Oliver Goldsmith, at that time still undistinguished, but in the very act of blossoming into fame, received a commission of fourteen guineas to write for Newbery a life of the strange old beau, Mr. Nash, who had died in 1761. On the same day, which was March 5th, he gave a receipt to the publisher for three other publications, written or to be written, so that very probably it was not expected that he should immediately supply all the matter sold. In the summer, he seems to have gone down to Bath on a short visit and to have made friends with the Bow's executor, Mr. George Scott, it has even been said that he cultivated the mayor and aldermen of Bath with such success that they presented him with yet another fifteen guineas. But of this, in itself highly improbable, instance of municipal benefaction, the archives of the city yield no proof. At least Mr. Scott gave him access to Nash's papers, and with these he seems to have betaken himself back to London. It is a heart-rending delusion and a cruel snare to be paid for your work before you accomplish it. As soon as once your work is finished, you ought to be promptly paid. But to receive your lucre one minute before it is due is to tempt Providence to make a Micawber of you. Goldsmith, of course, without any temptation being needed, was the very ideal Micawber of letters, and the result of paying him beforehand was that, he had simply to be popped into the mill by force and the copy ground out of him it is evident that in the case of the first edition of the life of beau nash the grinding process was too mercifully applied and the book when it appeared was short measure it has no dedication no quote, advertisement end quote, and very few notes while it actually omits many of the best stories the wise bibliophile, therefore, will eschew it, and will try to get the second edition issued a few weeks later in the same year, which Newbery evidently insisted that Goldsmith should send out to the public in proper order. Goldsmith treats Nash with very much the same sort of indulgent and apologetic sympathy with which the late Monsieur Barbe d'Orivilly treats Brummel. He does not affect to think that the world calls for a full-length statue of such a fantastic hero, but he seems to claim leave to execute a statuette in terracotta for a cabinet of curiosities. From that point of view, as a queer object of vertu, as a specimen of the bric-a-brac of manners, both the one and the other, the king of Beau and the emperor of dandies are welcome to amateurs of the odd and the entertaining. At the head of Goldsmith's book, stands a fine portrait of Nash, engraved by Anthony Walker, one of the best and rarest of early English line engravers, after an oil picture by William Hoare, presently to be one of the foundation members of the Royal Academy, and now and throughout his long life the principal representative of the fine arts at Bath. Nash is here represented in his famous white hat, Galero Albo, as his epitaph has it, the ensign of his rule at Bath, the more than coronet of his social sway. The breast of his handsome coat is copiously trimmed with rich lace, and his old, old eyes, with their wrinkles and their crow's feet, look demurely out from under an incredible wig. 
an umbrageous deep-coloured ramily of early youth it is a wonderfully hard-featured serious fatuous face and it lives for us under the delicate strokes of anthony walker's graver the great beau looks as he must have looked when the duchess of queensbury dared to appear at the assembly house on a ball night with a white apron on it is a pleasant story and only told properly in our second edition king nash had issued an edict forbidding the wearing of aprons the duchess dared to disobey nash walked up to her and deftly snatched her apron from her throwing it on to the back benches where the ladies women sat what a splendid moment imagine the excitement of all that fashionable company the drawn battle between the majesty of etiquette and the majesty of beauty the beau remarked with sublime calm that quote, none but abigails appeared in white aprons end quote. the duchess hesitated felt that her ground had slipped from under her gave way with the most admirable tact and quote, with great good sense and humour begged his majesty's pardon end quote. aprons were not the only red rags to the bull of ceremony he was quite as unflinching an enemy to top boots he had already banished swords from the assembly room because their clash frightened the ladies and their scabbards tore people's dresses but boots were not so easily banished the country squires liked to ride into the city and leaving their horses at a stable walk straight into the dignity of the minuet nash who had a genius for propriety saw how hateful this was and determined to put a stop to it he slew top boots and aprons at the same time and with the shaft of apollo he indicted a poem on the occasion and a very good example of satire by irony it is it is short enough to quote entire quote, fontanella's invitation to the assembly come one and all to hoyden hall for there's the assembly to-night none but prude fools mind manners and rules we hoydens do decency slight come trollops and slatterns cocked hats and white aprons this best our modesty suits for why should not we in dress be as free as hogs norton squires in boots End quote. why indeed but the hogs norton squires as is their wont were not so easily pierced to the heart as the noble slatterns nash turned aristophanes and depicted on a little stage a play in which mr punch under very disgraceful circumstances excused himself for wearing boots by quoting the practice of the pump-room bow this seems to have gone to the conscience of hogs norton at last but what really gave the death blow to top boots as a part of evening dress was the incident of nash's going up to a gentleman who had made his appearance in the ballroom in this unpardonable costume and remarking quote, bowing in an arch manner end quote, that he appeared to have quote, forgotten his horse end quote. it had not been without labor and a long struggle that nash had risen to this position of unquestioned authority at bath his majestic rule was the result of more than half a century of painstaking he had been born far back in the seventeenth century so far back that incredible as it sounds a love adventure of his early youth had supplied van brew in sixteen ninety five with an episode for his comedy of aesop but after trying many forms of life and weary of his own affluence he came to bath just at the moment when the fortunes of that ancient centre of social pleasure were at their lowest ebb queen anne had been obliged to divert herself in seventeen o three with a fiddle and a oak boy and with country dances on the bowling green the lodgings were dingy and expensive the pump-house had no director the nobility had haughtily withdrawn from such vulgar entertainments as the city now alone offered the famous and choleric physician dr radcliffe in revenge for some slight he had endured had threatened to quote, throw a toad into king bladud's well end quote, by writing a pamphlet against the medicinal efficacy of the waters the moment was critical the greatness of bath which had been slowly declining since the days of elizabeth was threatened with extinction when nash came to it wealthy idle patient with a genius for organization and in half a century 
he made it what he left it when he died in his eighty-ninth year the most elegant and attractive of the smaller social resorts of europe such a man let us be certain was not wholly ridiculous there must have been something more in him than in a mere idol of the dandies like brummel or a mere irresistible buck and lady killer like lausen in these latter men the force is wholly destructive they are animated by a feline vanity a tiger spirit of egotism against the story of nash and the duchess of queensbury so wholesome and humane we put that frightful anecdote that saint simon tells of lausen's getting the hand of another duchess under his high heel and pirouetting on it to make the heel dig deeper into the flesh in all the repertory of nash's extravagances there is not one story of this kind not one that reveals a wicked force he was fatuous but beneficent silly but neither cruel nor corrupt goldsmith in this second edition at least has taken more pains with his life of nash than he ever took again in a biography his parnell his bolingbroke his voltaire are not worthy of his name and fame not all the industry of annotators can ever make them more than they were at first pot-boilers turned out with no care or enthusiasm and unconscientiously prepared but this subtle figure of a master of ceremonial this queer old presentment of a pump-room king crowned with a white hat waiting all day long in his best at the bow-window of the smyrna coffee-house to get a bow from that other and alas better accredited royalty the prince of wales this picture of an old beau with his toy shop of gold snuff boxes his agate rings his senseless obelisk his rattle of faded jokes and blunted stories all this had something very attractive to goldsmith both in its humour and its pathos and he has left us in his life of nash a study which is far too little known but which deserves to rank among the best-read productions of that infinitely sympathetic pen which has bequeathed to posterity mr tibbs and moses primrose and tony lumpkin End of chapter eighteen